Welcome to the Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. I am one of your co-hosts, Derek Anderson. And on this episode of Corpse Club, I am thrilled to be joined by two very special guests. You know them as two of the original co-hosts of Corpse Club. You may also know them from other podcasts like F This Movie, Hanging with Toby Hooper, Craven Craven. But today we are here to talk with them about their new book, In Search of Darkness, the definitive look at 80s horror, the official companion book to the popular 80s documentary film series that is now available in hardcover at aminkpublishing.com. I am talking with Heather Wixon and Patrick Bromley. Thank you both for joining me today and congratulations on your new book. Thank you. And congratulations to you too, Derek. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yes, uh, I, I I was very honored that you uh, invited me to be a part of In Search of Darkness as an editor and just getting the chance to read through it before a lot of other people. Uh, that was a, a treat in itself. So uh, thank you for for allowing me to be a part of, of the book and uh, for giving me the chance to talk to you both about it today, too, because there is a lot of cool stuff to dive into. Thank you for letting us back on Corpse Club uh, because I forgot the secret handshake, but it's good to be back. Well, we never changed the locks, you know, so <laughs> the, the key will still work and we'll figure out the handshake. It might, I know I'm trying to fi- I'm trying to remember like how many moves we had in there, but I, I think we'll figure it out by the end. We'll it get, was we'll get very involved. It was it was a lot. <laughs> It was a lot, but in a, in a very good way, though. So, <laughs> this, the, you know, it's it, while while we try to decipher our, our horror handshake, uh, and it's not as cool as the horror BFFs handshake, but we're we're working on it. We're getting <laughs> we're, we're we're perfecting it. Uh, but you know, this is so cool because this is yeah, it's kind of like a reunion of sorts. But we have something really cool to celebrate that we that uh, you two spearheaded, and I was very honored to be a part of as well. And that is this amazing uh, coffee table limited edition hardcover book called In Search of Darkness, The Definitive Look at 80s Horror. Now, if, if you're listening, you may be familiar with the In Search of Darkness documentary film series that's been super popular. We had three installments of that documentary series, and it really dove into 80s horror like never before, talking with so many people that were involved with the genre and looking at countless movies from that decade. But now we get this awesome book to go with it. And it is, as someone who's spent a lot of time with this book already, like the photos, the the chapters that you, you both wrote, we're talking over 140 movies that are dissected in this book uh, from the 80s, all 80s horror. Uh, but just just as a starting off point, I'm really curious, like, how did each of you get involved with this book? Because it's it's really cool that we already had the documentary film series and now you both got to kind of dive into the genre even further with the book. So what was that like just getting involved with it and and getting to dive into it? Um, yeah, I guess I'll kind of start on, on this part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it all kind of came together just because of me, (laughs) um, (laughs) because, well, I was uh, a producer on the first in search of darkness. Um, and also like a talking head in, in the series as well. And also been writing books throughout the years on like special effects artists and things like that. And when I met, when I sort of came together with my current publisher, uh, Michael from AM Inc slash Dark Inc. Um, you know, we'd already had things going with the effects books and he was like, Hey, you know, I know, um, you know, the In Search of Darkness folks, like have they ever talked about doing a book? And I was like, yeah, actually when I was working more closely with them, I was like, I was going to write a book for them. Um, and, but my approach was actually going to be different, uh, the one, than the one we went with. And honestly, it probably would have been way more complicated. Um, and not nearly as thorough as the as the way we did it for this. Um, but yeah, so basically he was like, oh, you know, can you connect us? And I was like, yeah, sure, let's do this. And so I got him together with Robin Block, who is like the executive producer over at Creator VC. And they got to talking and then they're like, yeah, let's let's get this going. And Heather, do you want to write the book? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then I was like, OK, wait a minute. Hold up. Um, there is a lot 
of movies to talk about. And the one thing I want like to let people know is that this has been like in production for like a couple of years now. So the movies that are being focused on and celebrated in this book is actually only from the first two documentaries. So it's we I feel I still feel like we should have waited and got the rest of three in here, but like holy crap, 142 movies is a lot already. Um, so I don't know, maybe we'll have the super deluxe mega edition in like a few years or something like that. Um, but yeah, so basically like I started to kind of figure out what we were gonna do and Michael and I were going back and forth and then we were like, we need to bring somebody on. Um, and how I am working with you, Derek, we're like, I don't trust anybody else to edit me. Um, there was nobody else I would trust to write this book with me other than Patrick. So I was like, when Mike was like, oh, we should bring somebody on. And I was like, I know exactly who we need to bring on and basically wrote Patrick into it. So I don't know if you want to like sort of explain your, your part of the journey, Patrick. I'm just laughing, thinking about you texting Michael back being like, I know just the nobody. Oh, shut <laughs> up. Dude, come on now. Like you have your own website. You've been writing longer than yeah, I have. Well, yeah. And I'm like, you're like, in, you're like in fancy critic organizations. You're hosting screenings like, at, like once a month. Like you don't, you do way more than I do. Uh, you're certified written. fresh. I am certified fresh, <laughs> but I'm not a top critic, as they say. I'm uh, not a top critic anymore. So you you will always be a top critic. They can't take that title away from you. Oh, they have. They put it in print. It was in commercials. I no longer pose with swag on my social media. I'm no longer a top critic. <laughs> See, I, uh, I was driving like back that from. Now. <laughs> yeah, now you can. You can just burn bridges, baby. Uh, I burn. was driving back from St. Louis and I got a text. We stopped for gas and I got a text from Heather that said, hey, want to write a book? And I said, yes, I do. Uh, and we had to hit the ground running because we had lost a little bit of time due to some unforeseen circumstances. And so um, we wrote this. This all came together very, very quickly. And uh, we wrote pretty quickly not as quickly as everyone might have liked but we tried our best to write it as quickly as possible without sacrificing quality and we wrote a pretty kick-ass book yeah i, I, I mean, may I'd... be biased but i agree with that oh, <laughs> thank, thank you, you Derek. and it's wonderfully edited too oh, um, no. <laughs> but, well, the one thing you i took will out say all is my like... ums <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i don't know why i typed those you know that it adds character you know <laughs> he left in all the he left in all my likes and yes though okay so, yeah and all my totallys um but what's what's funny about that is like patrick was like kind of a machine because i when i write i get way too in my own head about things so like every single thing that i wrote i had so much pressure where i'm just like Oh my God, I'm writing about Maniac. This is a masterpiece. I, like, And I was just like so caught up in like making sure like I delivered because like I I just, I question myself all the freaking time. And then Patrick's like, here's four chapters. And I'm like, fuck you. Like, what are you doing? Like, you're killing me over here. And so I'm <laughs> delivering like Patrick stuff. And Michael's over there like, Heather, are you working? What are you doing? Um, you know, but in the midst of like trying to do this book, like I was trying to wrap up school. I started a new day job, like trying to like keep up with Daily Dead still, like, you know, also writing Monsters Makeup and Effects Volume 2 and getting that wrapped up. And so there was like a lot of things where I was like, I don't know why I did this to myself the way I did. Um, so I was trying my my darndest. And I think one of the things like, and I said this in a different interview, but I will say it again here is like, I just want people like, look, I know the economy is crap right now. I know this amount of money for a book is a lot. Um, I know me as a horror fan, I'd be like, oh, wow, really? But my goal, and I know Patrick's goal too, uh, and I know Michael, the publisher's goal too, like our goal collectively coming into this was to make sure that we delivered something that was a really good extension of what the documentary did. We didn't want to just rehash the documentary because that's lazy. Um, I I don't want somebody to spend their hard-earned money and not get anything new out of it. Um, so that was really, again, that was part of the pressure was like me going through like, 
you know, so many different like BTS videos, old interviews I would find. I found like these really great old interviews, uh, a bunch of different ones that Mick Garris would do with different filmmakers like during the 80s for Universal, which was really cool and really fun. Uh, Saying like, it was like, one of the ones I watched was like Mick Garris, John Landis, Joe Dante and John Carpenter just talking about like the state of horror. And it was right as um, American Werewolf had just come out, The Howling had just come out and The Thing was about to come out. Oh, wow. um, which was really fascinating. And like Mick for me is like, he's a great filmmaker, but God, I love his interviews. Um, so like just trying to like fall down on these different rabbit holes to kind of bring something new to the table. Um, and so I really hope we did that. I really hope that when anybody who bought this book comes away from it, they're like, hey, I might've learned something new or I might've discovered something like a new movie to like go find or anything like that. Cause I just didn't want to like give you know, people something that they've already gotten because that's just boring. I, I think it does a tremendous job, like you say, just extending what was presented in the documentary and really not just talking about like the finished product, but like the journey of how the each of these movies got made because like each one has its own backstory of, well, here's how the idea came about and here's how they got the financing or where they filmed it or what they had to overcome to make the movie in the first place. Because it's like each of these movies is almost like a miracle. Some some of these that they were able to be released. And so I think it's really cool that like the way that you broke these chapters into like these different sections and covered the history of it and then also had these really cool like film facts that are almost like these, like your own <laughs> trivia game. Like we could have a companion trivia, like horror trivia game with this book because there's so many like interesting facts and tidbits, but I really appreciated how, like how far into the movie that you went when you looked at it. Yeah. I think uh, for both of our chapters, I just know this from like reading over Patrick's stuff and knowing what I did, I think because also for space to reasons as well, because like, certain like most of the chapters had to be two pages we have mm. uh quite a few books that are like four pages because we did like extended sort of celebrations um but i think in a lot of cases we actually had to cut trivia down a little bit so I'm like there's like a bunch of things i had for i had been no i went long on killer clowns um but there was one in particular where i'm like i had i think i had like 10 different trivia facts because i just couldn't work it into the stuff i was writing and i think there's only like four or five and i was like ah so we get we really could eventually do like another extended edition of this because there's still so much out there, which is pretty cool. Like, you know, I mean, the thing is, we're getting further and further away from this decade. So being able to celebrate it and sort of preserve a little bit of it in some sort of form of like a historical document is kind of cool to me. But I don't know if that's just me being dirty. Well, it, it kind of has to function two ways, right, because it has to work as a way in for new horror fans who didn't necessarily grow up with all of these movies because we're all coming at it from a place of like, yeah, of course we've seen these movies. We've seen these movies dozens of times. We know them backwards and forwards, although that's not totally true because there were a handful of titles that I saw for the first time to write this book. Um, so it, it, it should be an introduction and sort of an entry point for new fans but then the people like us who grew up with these movies, you know, you have to go a little further for those people and not just say like, well, here's what the movie's about. It's like, yeah, I know what the movie's about. I know who's in the movie. Um, you want to give them a little bit of perspective, a little bit of history, a little bit of critical analysis. Like it's a it's it was a, a, a high wire act at times. Uh, and hopefully we made it all come together. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, too, because like when we first started, the first chapter I kind of wrote coming into it before, like we were really set on a format and everything like that uh, was actually The Fog. Um, and so I act, so I actually did a little extra on that chapter, which I didn't know was going to go into the book because they were like, oh, we're going to cut this out. And then I realized now that it's like now it feels out of place because it has like this really cool section about like fog and its female characters and things like that where we didn't really do that for like the other 141 <laughs> like movies and i'm like oh <laughs> shit but also it's the fog and the fog rules so i'm you know but i even said to them like when we were proofing i was like you guys realize you kept this in even though you told me we were going to just delete it because we didn't want to go that deep like or like 
we didn't want to have to like, you know, come up with like these sort of extra elaborate things when we had other goals in mind, um, you know, and, but it's in there. So anyway, I wrote really deep on the fog and then, you know, I guess I just look like a goof on the other ones. <laughs> so we'll see. Like you said, though, it's the fog. It's it's J- Jamie Lee Curtis, John Carpenter, Tom Atkins. Like, if anything deserves an extended chapter, I, I think the fog is definitely worthy of that. So I think yeah. it was it's it's a good uh, it's a good way to kind of go into the book. And then from there, it's like, you know, you're you, you kind of really set the stage for what's to come. But it's like the extended version. So if we ever do a, like a second edition, maybe every chapter is the fog length. Although that are might you require... also... I was like, are you trying to give us more work, Derek? Like, what are you doing over there? It also <laughs> explains why the book is called The Fog and 139 other 80s horror movies you didn't know of. <laughs> you know, that that the that, uh, super obscure Friday the 13th, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like the sequels for Friday the 13th get talked about so much now that the original is almost forgotten in a weird way. Like, it's almost its own thing. And of course, with the whole the killer and everything in that one it's it it does seem like it is kind of the odd one out strangely enough sometimes yeah i think it is actually yeah and you mentioned okay so there's over a hundred films in the book and obviously there's a lot of 80s horror films i thought (laughs) i thought you you both did such a great job getting a really wide variety of horror movies in this and and representing a lot of different facets of the genre and different different uh types of horror uh, when you were coming into this did you how did you like choose which horror movies to focus on because like, I, I can imagine that was a really difficult task in itself because you have to decide well we can cover this you know we can cover this one but we have to we can't do this one or what was that balancing act like for you when you're just trying to figure out what to write about um, yeah, I mean, basically, it was just the entirety of the films that were covered in In Search of Darkness 1 and 2. And then we made a whole master list of all of those titles. And then um, once I got the thumbs up in terms of bringing Patrick on board, then I kind of broke it down um, in terms of like who was going to write about which movie. And there were movies where I was like, I, you know, absolutely, I need Patrick to write about these films because... Either one, I found them way too intimidating, or two, like when I think of these movies, they're Patrick movies. So like I wouldn't even go near them. Like there's no way I'm gonna write about Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. Like that's just completely unthought of. Like, no, that's I would never do that. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, well shit, I kind of have to write about poltergeist because <laughs> it's poltergeist. So um it, so it was kind of like going through and just kind of trying to figure out like. I mean, I know my strengths and weaknesses as a writer. Um, I mostly just know Patrick's strengths because I don't see a whole lot of weakness. Um, <laughs> no, I'm serious because like, I think, was it, the, was it the beyond where I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I could take on Fulci right now. Yes, it Which, was the beyond. It was the beyond. And I mean, I freaking love the beyond, but I was like, in a, like, it was a really weird time with like work and stuff. And we just had to get it done so we could get that year finished up. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm so, like, completely intimidated. And I'm like, can you do this? Because, like, I just knew Patrick to kill it with the beyond. It's Fulci. It's Patrick. You know what I mean? And so, like, I was like, please. And you're like, yes, I got this. Um, And then we had a few, like, surprises that kind of came up um, for some titles that weren't in our master list that (laughs) as we were completing years. And they were like, where's this? Where's this? And I was like. Oh shit. So like I think like Patrick, you took one of those. I can't remember which one it was. Uh Layer of the White Worm. Yeah. And then I Ooh. took Evil. And then the one that we actually almost missed, which is kind of crazy, was Evil Dead 2. Um, which I don't know why it wasn't on our list. And then all of a sudden, my like the Michael was like, Where's Evil Dead 2? And I was like, it's not on the list. And he's like, Huh. Well, it needs to be on the list. And <laughs> I need it like by this weekend. And I was like, okay and i actually think i took a vacation day um because i was like shit like this is evil dead too i'm i gotta go i can't screw this up um and so i think i actually took that friday off from work so i could get it done um but yeah i mean i think it was just like trying to play to like our strengths in terms of things that i knew we loved things we were passionate about 
Um, again, like for example, like one of the movies that like I I absolutely love, but I'm always intimidated to even attempt to write about is like The Shining. But I was like, but oh, I knew yeah. Patrick had it. You know, I mean, it's it's The Shining. Like, holy shit! Like even now, I'm like, I don't know what I could write about it, but I'm like, I know Patrick can do it, and he did great. So yeah, so it was kind of that game, and then um, there was, I mean. I think we both had some of some titles that were probably not so favorites of us, but we had to get them done. <laughs> so I guess that's the polite way of saying that. Yeah, um, you can always find ways of saying like, this is really fun. Uh, ambitious. Without, right. Without getting into like, <laughs> this movie doesn't really work for me. You know, you don't want to say that in the book, but you can find ways around of or find ways around criticizing something and just try to focus on a movie's strengths you know so i don't think anybody reading the book if they're able to read between the lines they'll be able to tell like which movies we don't love but for the most part i mean we kept our opinions out of it um heather were there any like uh discoveries for you like a movie you saw for the first time that you were like oh this is so good um what did i have that i discovered when i was doing this I, oh, shit. I kind of feel like everything I wrote about, I sort of had already done. I mean, there was just a few movies that were sort of rediscoveries for me, I felt like. Like, okay. uh, The the Boogans was one that I hadn't really watched since the Blu-ray, I think, from Olive had come out in, like, 2011. Yeah. Um. So it was kind of nice to have like, an excuse to kind of go back and watch some of these things um like for example like i'm a house two gal i don't really watch house that much um so being able to kind of watch house again was kind of interesting um but yeah i kind of feel like everything that i did was pretty much stuff that i'd at least seen once like it might have been a while um but i will say like going down like and doing the research for some of these is really fun because i I do feel like in the process of writing this, I learned a lot. Um, but I know Patrick, there's like a few that like were were really new for you. Yeah, there were five or six movies that I had never seen before. Uh, so I had to watch them in order to write about them. And the one that stood out as being like, oh, this movie kind of rules is Russell Mulcahy's Razorback, the killer oh, boar oh. movie mm-hmm. that I had never seen. And I ordered a DVD off of Amazon because it was only a few dollars more than to rent it streaming. And I didn't want to rent any movies streaming because it's like, then you only have 24 hours in which to watch it. And we have to watch these things more than once and go back to them. And it's like, I can't get it all done within 24 hours. So I ordered the DVD and I wish I would have just splurged and ordered the Blu-ray because it's a great looking movie that would look amazing in HD and is a movie that I'll keep returning to. I should have just bought the Blu-ray. You should have bought the Blu-ray. Actually, it's funny. When I interviewed him years and years and years ago for the first season of Teen Wolf, um, I'd only seen Razorback twice at that point. I, I don't think I've actually watched it since then, but I remember re-watching it prior to Teen Wolf, and I was like, I brought it up during the junket, and he was, like, surprised. <laughs> and I was like, it's great. Are you kidding me? So I lo- It's really good. And then I... Yeah, and I think it's like it just got a Blu-ray release in the last couple of years, too. Yes. Yeah. And that is the same director who did uh, Resident Evil Extinction, which I think the more I think about it, I I think other than the first one, that might actually be my favorite in in the series. So I I was like the third one. That is the third one. Yep. It's kind of like the Road Warrior. Yeah. 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 That is one of the better sequels. Just some does something really different and and looks really good too, like the way yeah. they did Vegas and everything. Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to check out Razorback because that was new to me as well. And as same with the Boogans, like that's what I love about the book though, is because you're doing you're covering like you mentioned the Shining and in and, and Friday the Thirteenth and some of the more the the more corner pieces of the decade. But like what's so great about eighties horror is there's all these other films that came out that were maybe a little more low budget, high ambition or people that were just getting started or just stuff that for whatever reason didn't find as much of an audience when it came out. But now it's like it's finding uh, it's being rediscovered. So I love how there's like a good mix of that. Like each year, each year in the book, 
I think does a really good job of highlighting both well-known, but also like more obscure horror movies. So it's like a really good variety. Yeah. I mean, well, especially back in the eighties, cause you had like studios doing horror, but you had so many different independent uh, studio houses up there too, just kind of taking chances and doing whatever. And for as great as they were in terms of like getting movies made and giving, you know, getting those things like through the finish line, they didn't always distribute them or distribute them, distribute. What, what am I saying? Uh, <laughs> distribute them the proper way, or it was just different. Like, I mean, even like when new line did the original nightmare on Elm street, it wasn't like it came out in 3000 screens opening weekend. Like it was a slow rollout where they actually only had like a certain amount of prints and they had to like open it up in different cities, you know, starting in November. And then I just kind of kept catching on and catching on. Um, you know, so it was, it was a lot different back then in terms of like how these movies were getting out in front of fans. And to be honest, I think that's why there are a lot of movies, you know, we, we probably saw the bigger ones like the gremlins, you know, type of films or, you know, things of that, of that level. But most of these movies, for a lot of us, we were catching them on VHS for the first time or for your generation, Derek DVD. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I remember like that transition point where it was vhs but also dvd so it was like oh one's kind of coming in and the other one's phasing out a little bit but i do remember like the yeah the just like the feel of like a vhs box but it, nothing beats like the 80s art like the the vhs artwork though for the 80s movies and and sometimes it was a little deceiving like what they would put on the cover and it maybe had nothing to do with the movie but <laughs> but yeah, that was no, kind of totally. the joy of it yeah, I, I think the, also too. Oh, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. No, I, there's a movie I'm trying to remember. It's called uh, Future Kill. Have you guys mm. ever seen Future Kill? No. I've Google not. the artwork. The artwork is like some H.R. Geiger stuff, <laughs> and it's incredible. And then you watch the movie, and it is not that movie. Oh, no. <laughs> I just looked it up. That is cool. It's super cool, but then you watch the movie, and it's it does not live up to that amazing artwork. Lots of lots of. of eye makeup <laughs> on these characters. I'm looking at it, pictures from IMDb. This is yeah. oh, this looks way cool, but I guess not. I remember uh, the pit. Yeah. The pit was another one that had kind of maybe a little different artwork than what, or maybe it just made it look so like badass. You know, like oh man, I need to check that out. Uh, and then the movie is ten times better than that. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> that is what I'm building up to for sure. It is amazing. <laughs> well, I also think too in the '80s it was almost like you know it wasn't uncommon that like artwork was getting made before the movies were actually even right. shooting right. and things like that. Mm-hmm. So you, that's why you end up with like something like Chopping Mall that's about robots, but then you have like the sort of zombie esque hand with a shopping bag on your artwork because it looks cool and it's awesome and it sells something, but it's not exactly selling you the premise of the movie. That's what's really interesting too. Like when you were writing about some of these films and the, the backstories of like how they came up with the concept, it was a lot. I was amazed too for some of these films, like how it just started with, well, like a producer, you know, printed out a poster and then they like, here's the, here's our movie idea. And then they like had to go and write the script in two weeks or like Larry Cohen with uh, Q, the winged serpent, where like some, some other, uh, you know, film fell apart and he just happened to be in New York city. And he's like, well, let's make this other movie then. And it's like, wow, that's just the, the innovativeness of these, some of these filmmakers behind these movies. It's especially at that time where you're just, you're not really working with CG. You're just kind of working with your hands and and putting stuff together with practical effects and just kind of making it up as you go. Sometimes that it's kind of inspiring, like reading the stories of of some of the films that are featured in this book. Yeah, I think that's what's going on. Like another uh, company that was really uh, that did that, like almost nonstop through the 80s was New World Pictures. Mm, like mm-hmm. they they almost built a legacy of, of creating artwork and then being like okay let's how do we do this um and it, they, uh, maybe it is the larry cohen uh template bless him um you know so it's kind of cool that like i don't know like these days like i see a lot of folks are like oh if we can just put together like our two million dollar kickstarter we can start making our movie and i know patrick and i were on a different show where we were talking about basket case and it's like no nah, hannah lauder had 30 grand and was like we're gonna go make a movie and he went and made a movie so and it, to me it also like kind of like 
I love that sort of innovative spirit. Like to me, it really reminds me of like the team behind like WNUF and things like that, where like, they're just going to go make their stuff. It's It might take them a little time, you know, kind of the uh, Sam Raimi approach, but like, you're going to have a good time while you're watching it. And you don't have to wait to see if you're going to cross some sort of threshold to get your $2 million because you have to have super elaborate, whatever, you know, <laughs> it, in the eighties, you just kind of made it work. You're like, Oh, we need to like make guts or something. Let's, let's go make some oatmeal and put some like food dye in it. And, you know, maybe throw some raw meat into it and see what happens. You know, like <laughs> I miss that. Like, you know, give me oatmeal guts again. <laughs> Let's get that trending hashtag oatmeal guts yeah. <laughs> out of a balanced breakfast. <laughs> what and what's so cool too is like well Heather you have like you mentioned you had written you've written like Monster Squad and the the monsters makeup and effects uh, volume one and two uh, with with AM Inc Publishing uh, and so you you've researched extensively like so much of the practical effects and a lot of these artists they were up and coming in the eighties and they got to really like cut their teeth on like Nightmare on Elm Street or like some of these really uh, creature features that were coming out at the time. And so did you find that helpful? Like already having done so much research into the practical effects of that era, like when you were coming into this, did that give you a good, (laughs) (laughs) did that give you a good uh, backdrop uh, or a good uh, kind of way into uh, looking at these movies from that point of view? Uh, oh, absolutely. And also to, you know, what helped is like, to be really honest, like just my career in general, um, because I wasn't, I've never just been like somebody who was like solely focused on like junkets for new movies and things like that. Like there's nothing wrong with that, but that wasn't the primary focus of my career. My career has always been about like having conversations. And so, and you guys know, because I put you all through the paces, like every year with multiple different projects where we were doing like the class of series or like Halloween or like other like things that we would always do in Dilly Dead or like magazine articles and things like that where like we weren't just giving you here's a here's a look at what's going on in horror now like let's go ahead and take a look back and so I was able to kind of use a lot of the interviews that I've done over the years um, to kind of also add more context to a lot of the stuff that we were writing about. Um, and it was nice. It was really nice to sort of have that baseline um, because in certain chapters, it kind of gave me a little more confidence going into it where I'm like, oh yeah, I already t- talked about this extensively. Like to be totally honest, I probably could have like written Gremlins in my sleep just because like I'd seen Joe Dante present screenings of Gremlins like at least twice now. And like, you know, ha- having interviewed Chris Wallace and like, interviewed like interviewing Zach Galligan over the year like and so it's like it was nice to kind of already have some frame of reference for a lot of it because like I knew okay I've done this like I can I can build on that and take it further um and I think I even like referenced a couple of your interviews too Derek uh in there oh, I think there was nice. something yeah there was something you did oh your Friday seven I think or was it oh, oh God, uh, did... part six Part six, yes. Oh yes, Jason lives with uh yeah, that's right. Oh my gosh. Tom McLaughlin, yeah. Yes. That was so much fun. I remember we did that. I wrote that for when we had Deadly magazine, and that was like such a great way to like such a great excuse to like just write about that movie because I love that's like one of my favorite uh Friday the thirteenth films. And oh wow. So I'm okay, I'm gonna have to go back. I I was like, I was thinking of that article when I was reading that chapter, but now I'm really going to go back and connect the dots. Yeah, because I think I said like in a 2016 interview with Daily Dead or on Deadly Magazine or something. But yeah, I referenced, I think Ah, that one. And I feel like there's something else I referenced from something you wrote. I can't remember what it is right now. Um, But yeah, like it was just, it. you know, I like the challenges that the, the chapters where I pushed myself a little bit and got to go. Uh, in this things that I hadn't written about before, but it was also really cool because one, I would actually kind of go back to things that I'd written over the years and be like, oh, I've, I've gotten way better. <laughs> or like even <laughs> interviews that I've done earlier, I'm like, oh God, this kind of sucks. Like, thank God I, you know, was able to get better over the years at it. Um, but yeah, like it's, it, it was, it, it was fun because it really felt for as much of the celebration of the 80s, like in a lot of ways, just because I kind of knew where, 
my career was heading. It kind of felt like it was a really good, like sort of pin in what I've done since I started um, as well. Like it just sort of, everything felt like it was culminating at the same time. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, it, it's such a great, you both have written so, such, so extensively on eighties horror and having grown up with it too, and just having that passion for it. I think this was really a book that was made for both of you to, to be a part of and, and to write about and everything. And it was, uh, you know, was that for each of you, you know, just like going back to when you were watching these movies, maybe for the first time, what was, did it kind of, did it call back to like any nostalgia, like just writing about the movie or, or did you get to revisit anything that maybe you hadn't for a long time and it gave you a new appreciation for stuff that maybe you hadn't seen in a while or what was that like? Was it kind of like a walk down memory lane in some ways? Because I know you, you're both super passionate about that. I'll say era again. <laughs> what, what was uh, what was that like though? Just to uh, to kind of reignite that that passion for eighties horror. If the flame ever went out, I don't think it did. But <laughs> yeah, it never really did. It was it was definitely a ton of fun to go back and revisit a lot of favorites and come at them from a different angle because now you're approaching it as like a student of the film instead of just as an appreciator um and so i could watch something like graduation day which i've seen you know six or seven times and is like the textbook generic 80s slasher um but now I could be like, oh, but it's actually doing some really interesting things. And even though the effects aren't great and the performances are a little bit uneven, like part of what makes it special is where it fits within the cycle. And so I'm able to look at it from a different lens. Um, and again, just the fact that, you know, this is my favorite decade for horror, I think, helped a lot because as much as i would love to write a book on 50s horror or 70s horror like it would be much more of a learning curve i would be coming into those you know with way less experience and less i think joy towards the subject matter uh what makes the 80s so special as you guys have already pointed out is like the variety of stuff that was coming out um so one day I'm writing a chapter on basket case and the next day I'm writing a chapter on Firestarter, you know, and it's those movies couldn't be more dead. By the way, that's a bad example because those movies came out in different years. But the point is this, <laughs> the, the the movies couldn't be more different from each other. So it never felt like this sense of Groundhog Day setting in. It was like every new chapter was a new project was a new chance to appreciate a movie in a new way um and so as much as it was a job to try to get through all the chapters it was also like a cool opportunity to be a student of horror you know for the day or two that i'm studying that movie intensely and writing about it uh that part was really fun yeah, I mean, I think also, too, like, there's so many movies that I love that I have to regularly, I mean, I mean, every, I mean, I feel like most horror movies from the 80s, pretty much, they all have their fans at this point. It, you know, it might be a gross generalization, but, I, you know, everybody out there kind of has, like, a love for these weird offbeat movies now where, like, I used to be like, oh, Howling 2, nobody else likes Howling 2, and now there's, like, 50 people will pop up and be like, I love Howling too. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> sweet, that's awesome. You know, now so it's, it's about like, Halloween it's, 5. <laughs> yeah, you know, now we got to get through Tina. Um, but what's cool is like, I it was, it was fun to write about like the Halloween 5 type of movies where you get to sort of make the case for like, you know, people who immediately like sort of dismiss movies for this or that, or maybe they watched a movie once, didn't gel with it. Maybe they'll read this book and like go watch it again and like come at it from a different perspective themselves um but i was just excited because i know i literally don't know anybody who likes this movie but i actually now like that i've seen it like i think four or five times between craven craven and this book but like i i know it's a mess i know it's an unfinished movie but i still really i like the hills have eyes part two I know I shouldn't. I know Wes hated it, like, and it just never finished right. But like, I liked being able to write about it 
and make a case for it and make and be like, yeah, you know, is it the best movie that Wes Craven ever did? Of course not. Not even close. Was it only released because of Nightmare on Elm Street blew up? Of course. You know, it was a cash grab sort of, you know, let's throw this thing together, put a bunch of flashbacks in and like try to get this movie to be enough running time so we can get it out there on big screens. But like, I still like it. Like, I still enjoy it. Like, I don't know many movies where they've got like dogs having like flashbacks themselves. Like, and God bless it for that. Like, you know, I think I'd rather watch that than like the the same old overblown studio movies these days. Um, I mean, no, I'm not going to put it on like the same level of like New Dune or whatever, but you know what I mean? Like, I just, I, I appreciate things that just don't walk the same path as everything else. And you got so much of that in the 80s. So it was like, it was fun for me to be able to be like, hey, let's talk about The Hills Have Eyes Part 2 or Howling to Your Sister the Werewolf. And I'm so bummed that we had to, in- we had to include the quote where Joe Dante was like Christopher Lee, like, for, you know, basically apologized to me for doing this movie when he did Gremlins 2. And I was just like, he has nothing to apologize for. He's Christopher Lee. He wanted a paycheck. And he wanted to go wear super cool glasses and go hang out in a punk club and go like, go, you know, chase down werewolves in Transylvania. Who wouldn't? Exa- so, yeah. There's, there's nothing to apologize about those sunglasses. That is, we should oh, be no, thanking him. We should have been thanking right him. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like you mentioned, the Hills Have Eyes part two and the whole, it's, it's really cool that there is a chapter about that because the whole like story behind that movie is almost as like fascinating as the film itself and like why Prob- it, why it came out that way, you know? Yeah. I mean, well, if I'm being honest and like I said, I'm not, I'm never going to call it one of Wes Craven's best movies ever, but maybe, the, maybe the BTS story of it is might be more fascinating than the movie itself for most people. Um, you know, so again, it's a movie that people, I mean, so many people just kind of outright dismiss as, as it is. And that's totally fine. I'm never going to tell anybody that they're wrong on it. But, you know, maybe somebody is going to read this and be like, hey, I'm going to go ahead and watch it. It's always streaming on Tubi, so you'll find it. <laughs> um, you know, and maybe you'll have fun with it. And it's not like, you know, I'm not looking for it to be the next Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, it's just a goofy sequel that, you know, has dog flashbacks like in, in motocross. Like, that's cool. More right. movies should have that. Context matters, you know, especially for movies like this. And so you can appreciate it more knowing what they were up against. And hopefully this book does provide a lot of context for stuff, even if it's just like, hey, just so you know, this movie was not a hit when it came out. This beloved horror movie that everyone has seen and owns a copy of on Blu-ray was a bomb when it came out. And I think that's important to know. And I think that's interesting. And so hopefully details like that will only uh, allow people to grow in their appreciation for a lot of these movies. Patrick, really quick, I have a question for you because I don't think I've ever asked you this. What was the hardest movie to write about for you? Uh, I mean, there's like multiple different answers. The Shining probably took me a long time because... It's this scary mountain that I'm afraid to climb. Um, There's a couple of movies that there just isn't that much information about. And so like trying to get two pages was a challenge. Um, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer was like not fun to write <laughs> because it i'm meant sorry that... i did no that it's fine I apologize. <laughs> it meant that i had to watch henry portrait of a serial killer like a couple of times and it's a very good movie but it's just hard to watch um i don't i feel like i feel like the shining was like the most intimidating yeah i mean to be really honest i i chicken shit out on that one i was like ah <laughs> I was like, no, 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 Patrick is so going to do so much better at this. I was like, I can't take on their shining. I'm like, I already got to deal with the changeling that year. I'm like, I can't do two of these, like, super, <laughs> right, you know, right. prestige horror movies. Like, are you right. kidding me? Come on. I mean, when there's a whole documentary about all the themes in the movie, that is a oh, daunting exactly. task. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, and I have to fit this all in a few pages. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that that does remind me too. What what's really cool about looking as, as I was like reading and editing this book and looking at all the different movies that were assembled, like you see all these different 
you kind of see a pattern, like you kind of get to trace the rise and fall of the slasher film or just how prevalent Stephen King adaptations were becoming throughout the decade and how like slashers were having to kind of reinvent themselves or do something different to stand out. Was, was that kind of fun for, for both of you? Like did, when you were kind of, cause by the time you get to the late eighties, you're, when you're writing about these movies, the it's a lot different than the early 80s as far as what the genre was going through. It's kind of almost reminds me of like how, you know, the early 90s brought about like grunge and it kind of killed like 80s rock and roll in a way for a little while. Like was what did you kind of notice patterns like that or was it kind of interesting to look at the history of the genre as it went from like 1980 to 1989? Yeah, I mean, I think Patrick would agree with this is that there's definitely a decline a little bit towards the end of the decade. Like 88 was like the most ridiculous year we had to write about because it was like 300 movies or some some ridiculous number like that where it was like, I, I don't I don't know how you felt, Patrick, but like I was like getting through and I was like, oh, my God, we're getting close to 88. This is going to be intense. <laughs> uh, and then we get into it. But I'm, I'm like, I think there's like 20, like I'm like, two, four, six. Six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. I think there's like 21 or 22 movies from 88 alone. Um, so I think for us, that was probably like the, that was the big chapter. And it's interesting because it is late in the decade. But if you look at the lineup of the movies from 88 versus like early 80s, which was a little more serious, a lot less teens, um, still a little more like grounded in 70s aesthetics and things like that versus maybe what we were seeing in 89 which was sort of I think definitely where the genre itself was starting to like shift a lot and we were seeing you know franchise fatigue was setting in um you know so it was it, there definitely are these interesting trends and you can kind of see where like you know movies kind of changed how things were because like you get Fright Night in 85 and then all of a sudden in the next few years there's like two vampire movies each each year that we're covering and things like that and there's even vampire movies that came out that we didn't include in the book and yeah so it's i i love trends and things like that like that's something that always interests me um do you i don't know if you get as nerdy about that patrick yeah for sure i i almost feel like you could track the entire decade just by looking at the arc of like the friday the 13th series which i know we brought up earlier in the show but like by the time you get to 89 and it's Jason takes Manhattan, which a movie that has its fans. Um, <laughs> I'm you like could how just po how politically correct is it? Like it has its fans. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> feels tired, you know, and it's like. We didn't. We didn't write about every. Friday movie, right? I only did seven and eight. We did uh, one, two, for some reason, they didn't have us do three. Four, so I guess they did six, did seven, four, eight. Four, yeah. Six, yeah, six, seven, eight. So we missed three and five. Those are two of my favorites. I would have gladly done that. <laughs> and had they been on our list, I would have given them to you, especially <laughs> five, because I yeah. wasn't touching it. I, I feel like um, we missed out by not having Patrick do five. That I was waiting for that right. when I was reading it. I was like, oh, he's going to do five. And then we went right it to never six. Happened. Oh, man. So basically what we're saying is we have to like pull all the copies of the book and write a chapter five. And I'm just I'm going to just sneak, five. I'm going to type it up uh, and just sneak pages into the books at the signing. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be, That'll uh, be uh, your get your free gift to anyone who shows up to the book <laughs> signings, right. whether they want it or not. Bonus chapter yes. Friday five, a misunderstood masterpiece. <laughs> the unauthorized second edition of In Search of Darkness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is really interesting, especially seeing how uh some of these franchises, like you say, they they changed uh, over time, and Nightmare on Elm Street was another example of of just seeing how they had to try to keep keep things fresh and then of course the you know as the decade went on things were so different compared in the genre compared to the early days early 80s versus late 80s so but uh it, it that's part of the fun though i like that we i like that there's a mix of you're covering sequels but then you're also covering you know like 
chi- the, the original child's play. And so there's like franchises that have been around for the whole decade. And then all of a sudden there's like the newcomers to the party towards the end of the decade. And, and also uh, some great uh, foreign films in there too, with Italian horror and Argento and, and uh, Tetsuo, the Iron Man, like th- there's just a really good variety. It's a good, uh, good medley of, of films that you're, we're looking at in this book. Tetsuo was a hard one to write because uh, it, you have to find multiple ways to say, like, I don't totally know what the fuck is going on in this movie, but it's, but it's cool. fascinating. <laughs> Yo, it's so yeah. cool. And talk about a movie that's like original on a budget and talk about a movie that is all vision and ambition. Uh, what they achieve in that movie is amazing. But trying to explain it to a reader is like uh, you kind of got to see it for yourself. Yeah, that one yeah. was fun to read. That one and and uh, so the photos too. Like the those are some memorable photos in the book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was another one I was really intimidated by because I've only ever seen it once, and I was like, "Oh God, okay, sorry, Patrick, here you go." <laughs> but you nailed it. Oh, thank you. As you did so many times throughout the book. Well, you both nailed yep. it, and it it really was so much fun and and I was really honored just to be able to like look at this book ahead of time and read through it and really soak it in and just looking at the table of contents right now it's just like wow that is it is amazing how much ground is covered in in this book and how you're kind of getting all these different slices of the genre and you know we go from I think it starts with uh Inferno and we end on Silent Night Deadly Night 3 so it's it's a lo- it's a lovely encapsulation of the decade, I think. <laughs> Actually, we do we do start on the fog. The fog. Oh, right, the fog. Yes. Yeah, it was February because everything is everything in the book for for those listening is goes in chronological order according to release date. Um, so we didn't do like alphabetical or anything like that. But yeah, so the fog was February eighth, nineteen eighty. That is how the decade of horror started, and wow. then yes, ended with. <laughs> uh, night, Deadly Night Three. Deadly Night Three. Better watch out! <laughs> Bill Mosley's brain in a plastic bubble exposed on his head. <laughs> All the best movies in the '80s had a brain in in plastic, though, because that was also something in Blood Diner. Um, yeah, it sure was. <laughs> and also, just not a movie that's horror, but sci-fi with uh, the man with two brains. Love that! Oh, it's such a great movie. That should be in the book, too. We should add that in for the second edition. <laughs> a lot of horror yeah, that, influences in that one. I'm not, misre- I'm not mis- misremembering. That was like early 80s, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was 83. Okay, good. I was like, wait, am I just Mandela affecting myself? Because I, like, I swear <laughs> to God, I remember seeing that. That's one. My dad actually quotes that movie quite a bit. So I, I have a, a fond affection for that movie. So I, I need to revisit that. And uh, but yeah, well, maybe we can sneak it in for uh, the extended edition. and and just uh looking at this book as a whole i thought kind of a a fun thing to do before we wrap things up would be to for each of us especially because patrick i know you're always you're always curating your own movie marathons on f this movie and i thought what would be fun is if each of us had curated our own horror movie marathon selecting five films that we would program together uh, but they would have to be from movies that were showcased in the in search of darkness book so i'd love to go around our our table here our metaphorical table and uh maybe starting with you heather maybe uh just sharing what our five films would be and and what we would group together for our uh moviegoers to enjoy whether it's on the drive-in screen or or a haunted theater or wherever it may be uh what what five films would you like to feature from in search of darkness well i am it's it's funny because most people say that like horror comedies are like lesser uh entries in in sort of the genre world which i totally disagree with um but i went with horror comedies as my theme my five movies yes um so the first movie that i chose um is motel hell i thought that'd be a good way to sort of start and set the mood because you know nothing's better than Farmer Vincent's fritters. Um, it's a good appetizer, I think. Um, and then I went on to probably one of my all-time favorites for my second movie, um, which is Richard Wink's Vamp. Um, just because I love Vamp so much and I will champion 
the hell out of that movie anytime that I get get the chance. And I was like, I can't even tell you guys, like, I thought it was my birthday on the last uh, episode of the the special that Joe Bob did for Valentine's Day, I think it was, for uh, the last drive-in. And the second movie was Vamp. Like, I almost, like, fell out of my seat. I was so excited. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I'm not texting dinner. Brian's going to be so pissed at me, but I've got to get in on this. Um, yeah, so my second choice was Vamp. And then I felt like a really good, like, middle of, like, middle of the marathon movie um, because I adore it so much. And every time I rewatch it, I'm just like, gosh, I should be watching this more, uh, is Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, um, because that movie is just absolute perfection. And I love it so much. Um, so that was my third choice. And then after nice. that, I'm like, well, I want to go zany. I want to go a little bit out there. Um, and so my next choice is Killer Clowns from Outer Space, which is about to get its own video game. Blows my mind, like almost 40, like 35 years later, uh, is kind of crazy it's for a movie to be getting its own video game. But I will be there day one to play. <laughs> um, and then I wrap everything up with another all time favorite of mine, um, which is Fred Walton's April Fool's Day. Nice. So that, that's, oh, that's, that's, that's a that's good way my, to wrap it up. Heather's horror comedies of the eighties that we wrote about. Cause I chose one and I was like, wait, this isn't in the book. And I had to re- undo it. So what was the one that you wanted to program, but wasn't in the book? It's one that I'll always champion uh, Friday night part two. Cause there's a lot of comedy in that one. There is. Yeah. Ooh, that is a good one. John Grease for the win. Like the practical effects in that one too are amazing. Yeah, for sure. Totally. All right. That is good. I like and I like that. I like your sh- that you're showcasing horror comedies because it, I think it's good to laugh and be scared in the same film. And I think that's kind of like a, a hallmark of 80s horror, too, is that it, it, it so frequently made us laugh at the same time that it was like grossing us out or or there's just like a playfulness there that I think really works. I would totally agree with that. I like uh, horror comedy more than I like comedy horror because I had to like write about full moon high and there's only so many ways to be like Larry Cohen is the best, but we can all agree this isn't very funny, right? (laughs) It's funny because I've only ever seen it once. And yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I. It's just so corny. Like he just has such a corny sense of humor and. Again, there's a lot to enjoy in the movie. I'm not even bagging on the movie because, again, I know people love it. Uh, but when a movie wants to be funny first and foremost and isn't, it's hard to uh, get around that fact. Yeah. But, you know, comedy is subjective. So there's somebody listening who's like, what? That movie's hilarious. And that's Oh, great. you're in trouble now, Patrick. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> Let the hate mail cometh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at Patrick Bromley. <laughs> you're, you're not hiding with the username, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, Patrick, w- that leads me to your movie marathon. What five films and and in what type of theme are you maybe going for with your In Search of Darkness marathon? Well, my theme is a universal theme. Uh, and it is movies that start with the and a B word. Ooh, so alphabetized. So we're going to kick things off with The Blob uh, from 1988, directed by Chuck Russell. One of my favorite horror movies of the 80s. One of the best remakes of all time. Uh, you got to start marathons with a banger. And mm-hmm. uh, The Blob will grab everyone's attention. Plus, I like the idea of being in a movie theater and watching a movie where the blob attacks a movie theater. It adds extra fun. Uh, If you really want to have a good time, throw jelly at people during the movie and watch them freak out. Um, Then I thought we would lighten things up and go with The Burbs from Joe Dante, the great Joe Dante comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, then it's getting late. We got to start getting weird. That is a hallmark of every marathon that I program. So I like to go Italian. So we're going with the beyond from Lucio mm-hmm. Fulci, who is on my shirt as we speak. Uh, it's my favorite Fulci movie. 
I was excited to have the opportunity to write about it, even though, again, it came about more so because Heather was going to have a Fulci nervous breakdown because uh, she'd already written about two of his movies. <laughs> and it was like, uh, well, and also too, but also too, like you should, I should have just given it to you from the start. Like, I don't even know what I was thinking. No, it's okay. Um, that movie's amazing. And uh, I got to see it theatrically once it plays amazingly uh on a big screen uh and then we're gonna keep things weird with jackie kong's the being Ooh, Yay! i thought you were gonna say blood diner but that that's a good one too. there's no the in blood oh. diner derek <laughs> it's not the blood diner uh, i thought you were an editor derek i know <laughs> uh just uh hold on one sec i'm gonna go and uh look through the manuscript real quick got a couple last minute changes to make but okay good <laughs> Uh, joe bob <laughs> borgs um so <laughs> the being is probably my favorite jackie kong horror movie she only made two horror movies but i think i prefer this one to blood diner it's a little less goofy while still having a real sense of humor about it martin landau has a really funny performance and the creature is fun uh and then we're gonna wrap things up with a good old-fashioned summer slasher the burning uh so we can watch cropsy kill kids at camp nice it's always a good, it's always a good way to wrap it up with, with right? some cropsy I, I yeah i like that idea too of like doing a slasher it's super late or i guess it's early morning at that point so yeah. just give someone get, get that energy going a little bit and uh yeah i like that i like so it's like the theme is t and B. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there's A and to we're going to give everyone to tuberculosis. <laughs> and also, yeah. Oh, gosh. And, and I like, too, the blob that just reminds me of just how many amazing, like, horror remakes there were in the 80s, which, like, I, I think sometimes gets forgotten is, is just, you know, how many, like, 50s and, and 60s movies were being remade at that at that time. So I think that is definitely one of uh i think it's right up there with the thing um but i guess we can't we can't have that in that mar in that marathon because it's no, a, a tnt yeah <laughs> well that is awesome so i uh so that, i guess that just leaves me for my in search of darkness movie marathon and i think my theme here is going to be horror sequels which nice. I think we'll either be I almost, fun. I almost did that. <laughs> I know you did. Uh, well, I'm glad uh, that I would have had to call an audible then if uh, <laughs> I'm glad. And you would have had a dumb theme like the B word. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking through the table of contents here, grabbing uh, <laughs> everything that starts with D. Uh, but <laughs> so I think I'm so this this theme will either like be fun for people or confuse them if they're you know worried about continuity and they're not caught up on each franchise but i figured you know what let's just do it so um, i'm going to start off with friday the 13th part six jason lives because well one heather you reminded me of how awesome it is when we were talking about it earlier in this episode and i just i think it's such a fun friday the 13th movie i think it, it just really Tom McLaughlin, McLaughlin was really just firing on all cylinders. And I think it has such an energetic opening. And also the fact that it's like summer camp when the kids are there too. And like Jason's running around. I think it's just a really interesting installment in that franchise. So I'm going to start with that one. Then I'm going to go with Phantasm 2, which I find to be really interesting. I, I really like it. I know it's definitely kind of the odd one out in that franchise for some of the casting reasons and that it was like the the big but budget studio movie in the phantasm franchise so it kind of strayed from maybe some of what they were doing in the other ones but i've always had kind of a soft spot for that one so i i think it's really polished and sleek and i i think there's some good uh good good uh sphere uh kills in there as well so i'm definitely going to go with that as my second pick and then third why not pair the third one with Halloween three season of the witch, uh, which I, nice. yeah, <laughs> yeah. That is uh, another one that I've just always really liked. I think obviously people 
used to really uh, not be too kind on it because they were, you know, expecting the Michael Myers uh, resurgence with it and, and instead, uh, you know, got something else. But I, I really like that we got a Tom Atkins Halloween movie and I think people have definitely come around on it. And uh, that has probably the catchiest theme song in any horror movie from the eighties. So <laughs> except for maybe the stuff, um, <laughs> but I'll save that for my TNS movie marathon <laughs> and for number four i am gonna go let's see so it's getting later uh people may be getting a little sleepy so let's let's uh let's be rocking with docking and crank up a nightmare on elm street three dream warriors which has definitely always been a favorite of mine i think it's my favorite nightmare on elm street movie which I don't know if that's blasphemous to say when you have the original and and also some other really good entries, but I've always loved Dream Warriors, so I'm going to go with number four as Dream Warriors just to crank the energy up, and then to before we send everyone off into the the sunlight of a new dawn, let's go Evil Dead Two, uh, since nice. we were also talking about that, and I think that'll that'll I think energize people a little bit, give them a little caffeinated shot of deadite and mayhem so and I, I think you really can't go it's a good mic drop so i think uh that's a safe one to end on nice i like it dead by dawn literally oh my gosh <laughs> yes yeah that is uh that's perfect so i didn't even think of that so that is that's fun so if you uh and if, if anyone listening has their own marathons they want to curate when the the book is released definitely uh Give us a shout out on on Twitter or, or Facebook or whatever social media you're using and whatever <laughs> that social media may be called. And uh, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> I know the names are changing a lot these days. So I just <laughs> for the outlets. So I just want to make sure we're, we're covering all of our bases. But uh, well, that's awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks uh, so much to you, Heather and Patrick, for for curating uh, some movie marathons and and for talking about In Search of Darkness, uh, the definitive look at 80s horror. This was a lot of fun. Well, thank you, Derek, for all of your hard work and bearing with us and going through all of this and being part of it alongside us, because we would not be here today talking about this book had it not been for you. Absolutely not. Oh. Oh man, I'm going to get a little teary eyed here, but it was, it was fun uh, being in the trenches with you both. And I, I honestly learned a lot. Uh, through like the just the multi-year process it's been on this journey so it's it's really fun to kind of take a moment and and look back on it all so uh that is that is uh really really cool and and i really appreciate it as well and and also i i would be remiss if i didn't mention that if you'd like to order your own copy of in search of darkness the definitive look at 80s horror uh, be sure to visit aminkpublishing.com it's uh, published under their Dark Ink imprint, and there are more copies on the way due to demand, and it is shipping out uh, this month uh, in March here. So it's going to be really exciting. Hopefully everyone out there, when you get your copy, be sure to share some photos on, on social media and let us know uh, all about it. And also, uh, Heather and Patrick, you'll be uh, doing a signing at Dark Delicacies Bookstore in Burbank, California on Saturday, April 27th. And it sounds like you're going to have some really special guests there as well. Yeah, um, so far we've got uh, announced uh, is Joe Dante and Tom Holland, as well as Kelly Maroney, effects legend Steve Johnson, as well as other effects legends. Um, Edward and Stephen Kyoto, we're still working on our, our getting our trifecta of Kyoto's involved. And I don't know, maybe we'll have our editor Derek Anderson there too. Um, but we potentially also have some uh, surprise guests going to be joining us as well. So uh, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, and one thing I do want to mention about the book. Um, so this is actually like a limited edition run of the book. Um, there will be like a paperback version that does come out this fall, um, but they only printed like 1500 of these books. So basically when they're gone, they're gone. Um, and they're not going to be, this version is not going to be reprinted. Like this is it. Um, so if it oh, is wow. something you're thinking of, yeah. So if it is something you're thinking about. Um, and I know in the pre-sales, we sold a little over a thousand of them. So 
if you've been kind of on the fence and like, I don't know, like this is like kind of your your chance. Um, not to say the paperback's not going to be version isn't going to be awesome too. It's just going to be different. You know, it's not going to be as fancy. Um, and you know, we I think they've put uh, like fifty to seventy of these uh, to the side for the signing because they've already had a lot of folks pre-ordering books there. And for anybody who can't go to the signing but you want to have it signed, they uh, Dark Delicacy does ship. Um, so that is an option as well. Um, but yeah, like I just putting it out there that like once these 1500 are gone, they're gone. Um, and that is that. So, um, yeah, we just wanted to like, for those who put their faith in us from doing the pre-orders and those who've been following along with In Search of Darkness for years and are also part of this journey with the book, like we wanted to make something special, you know, that just felt like was kind of something that's like theirs and like, eventually it's just not going to be like available. Like it's like this cool thing to have. So. That's really, so it is like a true collector's item. This, this yes. run of it. And, and it definitely, I, I would after, I mean, looking at the photos in here, it is the ultimate like coffee table book. So if, listeners, if you do want like a, uh, this nice hardcover edition that you can put out and impress your friends when they come over for your Halloween parties and whatnot, like this is definitely a really, really cool version to have. So I think it would uh, be a good addition to, you know, your bookshelf or anybody's coffee table. This is the one to have. Totally. And, <laughs> I don't know how and, else to say it. I'm like, totally. <laughs> no, that, that is perfect a... for an 80s horror book, though. Uh, it's <laughs> totally it's totally awesome. And, you know, it, definitely uh, be sure to check it out. And, and if you can get to the signing, um, and who knows, like Heather said, maybe I'll even make my way there. I'm, I'm already blushing just thinking about it. But <laughs> if but, nothing uh, else, show up for Derek, everybody. Come on. <laughs> but this is this has been great. And uh, it's it's so fun going down uh, memory lane with uh, just the making of the book, but also 80s horror. And so definitely, again, if you do want to uh, learn more about the book signing, go to uh, Dark Delicacy's uh, website. And also you can order... Uh, this limited edition book at aminkpublishing.com. And we there's uh, uh, links on there for pre, for ordering and pre-ordering. And definitely make sure to check it out before everything is gone because then it's only the price, you know, the price on uh, on eBay is only going to go up from there. So make, sh make sure you get a copy while you can. And uh, on that note, uh, definitely want to thank Heather and Patrick again. And we also want to thank Brian, our engineer, for helping us out each and every episode of Corpse Club. And as always, we want to thank our listeners, including those of you who have signed up for a Corpse Club membership and have taken the time to listen to this and, and all of our previous episodes. Uh, make sure to visit corpseclub.com to check out our latest episode. And don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Every rating and review really does help. And uh, be sure to, to give those uh, those positive reviews out too when, when the book is released. Uh, you can also find us on Google Play, SoundCloud, and all of your favorite podcast providers. If you want to get in touch, you can reach us anytime at contact at corpseclub.com or on Twitter at Daily Dead News or at Corpse Club and on Instagram and Facebook under Corpse Club. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, Stay scary.